Okay, so I'm back. Um, hopefully you uh, stretched your legs, got a little snack, did something. Um, let's continue with this brief uh, historical tour again that I'm doing virtually online instead of taking up time in class for it. So in the first of these um, segments we talked about Aristotle, Hippocrates, Descartes, and Galvani. Let's, let's move on and talk about um, some more modern individuals and, and some of their contributions as well. So now we jump forward from both um, Galvani and Descartes who were working in the 17th century and now we're coming a little bit more closer to the modern era and we're in the 19th century. So first off we have Johannes Müller and I believe he's working in Germany. Uh, one of the people at the forefront of, of studying nervous systems and trying to figure out how they work. Um, he makes a couple of suggestions that I think are, are useful for us to be aware of because they end up kind of influencing the trajectory of subsequent uh, researchers trying to follow in his footsteps. Um, one of the suggestions that um, Muller made was to experiment uh, to change things to un in order to understand nervous systems. Uh, reportedly, up until Muller, many folks trying to, to study nervous systems and figure out how they work, they, they try to just carefully observe. And obviously observation is at the core of, of science. But he said and made, made the claim that simply observing, just watching, wasn't enough that you needed to do more. Rather than just observe, he believed you needed to change and then observe what would happen after this. And we'll talk about some individuals who kind of heeded that uh, encouragement and, and used it to try to gain greater, greater clarity about how nervous systems and brains work. Um, not without controversy, by the way. So that's one idea for him. He was an early advocate of experimentation and subsequent neuroscientists um, took him up on that. Many of them did. Uh, the other idea that's also associated with him is a little more intricate, although hopefully some examples will help bring this to life. And this is the idea that is known as the doctrine of specific nerve energies. And so, how to get this across. Um, imagine that we're going to put you in sort of a magical spaceship and shrink you down. There was a Dennis Quaid movie years ago called Inner Space where they took this kind of fancy ship and shrunk him down and shot him into an animal and he travels around in the bloodstream and eventually gets into a human being, if I remember correctly, too. So um, imagine that that's happened to you and you've been shrunken down and you're inside our brain, uh, inside the brain of a person, and that person sees something. You know, they're watching a, a panopto recording of a, of a biopsychology lecture, for instance. and as the light from that recording hits their eyes, there's some neurons in their eyes that translate it. We'll be talking about those later in the quarter. And the message then travels through your brain on these cables, these axon cables, and they get to the parts of your brain that enable you to see, and you can see what's in front of you. And so you're in your microscopic ship and you see one of those messages travel by. And you imagine what that would look like if you could actually see it. Now, similarly to seeing the presentation, this person is also hearing the presentation. So sound waves go down their ears, they shake some bones around, which cause some other neurons to translate those vibratory movements into signals in your brain. And then similarly, there's other pathways carrying that information that then travels from your ear to other parts of your brain and then you get to hear. And imagine you see that too. So you see visual messages traveling down, uh, neural fibers, you see auditory messages traveling down neural fibers. Maybe you, for instance, smell something in the room. There's, you know, cookies being baked, and so those chemicals in your nose translate into signals in the brain, which then travel. And my question to you is, as you watch these signals from different senses travel by, can you tell what the sense is by looking at the signal? So by watching an action potential go by, can you tell that it's vision? Can you tell that it's sound? Can you tell that it's smell? And the answer would actually be no. Because once it gets into the brain, apparently, the messages are the same. When neurons activate, they, they send the same message. It takes the form of this action potential that travels. So the weird question is, if, if once it's in the brain, it always looks the same, how is it that we have the sense experience in the first place? Because Again, how, do, how does the brain differentiate it? And here's where Miller's idea came into play. Turns out he's largely right. 
Um, what matters is what pathway is activated. If you activate and send a message down a certain pathway, you'll have one sense. But if you activate another pathway with the exact same message, that looks exactly the same, because it's a different pathway, you get a different sense. And so that's what the doctrine of specific nerve energies argues. Different experiences happen to us because different pathways are activated to produce them. However, once a pathway is activated, that pathway looks like any other pathway activated. So it's not that a visual message looks one way in the brain, but an auditory message looks a different way in the brain. The messages always look the same, but how we tell the difference is what's the route. The route matters. That's the doctrine of specific nerve energies. To speak to the importance of a route, I usually mention to students that I believe I have a mild form of tinnitus, although strangely it's been getting a little better in recent years and I'm not sure why. If you don't know, tinnitus is a term that refers to ringing in your ears. So I remember when I used to live in my first apartment with my wife when I was um, just starting to teach. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would hear this noise kind of uh, 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 and it, I lived near I-90 and it sounded to me like a person driving a semi truck who didn't know how to shift and so I would hear that in the middle of the night and go man that guy he needs to learn to drive and I would fall back asleep not thinking much of it. My wife and I after we got married then moved to our house in, in Kirkland which was a long way away from the freeway and strangely I woke up in the middle of the night there right after I moved there and I heard the trucker who couldn't drive again. And I went, oh my gosh, he's, he's stalking me. You know, what's he doing here? And it turns out there was no trucker who didn't know how to drive. The thing was, I had tinnitus in my ear. I had this ear ringing. And so to test this out, once I kind of clued in, I went downstairs to the most quiet room I could find in my house with no sound, you know, no clocks, no furnace, no vents. And I just sat there and I listened and I heard. I heard the uh, 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 uh that was this ringing that I have in my ear. Why do I hear a sound that doesn't exist? Somewhere along the pathway of my brain that processes sound, there's a piece of it that's being activated. And because it's activated, what's my experience? Sound. Again, back to Muller, the pathway shapes the experience. Activate a particular pathway, you'll get one experience. Activate a different pathway, you get another one. And so those are ideas to link with Muller. Again, early advocate of experimentation and also uh, an early definer, if you will, of this concept of the doctrine of specific nerve energies. Okay, so I told you that Muller was involved in encouraging researchers to experiment. Let's talk about two people who followed through on that. Uh, one was Pierre Florenz, uh, working in uh, France, and the other was Paul Broca, who I want to say was in Germany too, although I forget exactly where he was working. So let's start with Florenz. Florenz, he heeds Muller's call to change nervous systems, not just observe them, but change them and then see what happens. And what he does is he gets animals and starts damaging parts of their brain intentionally and then seeing what happens. And, and this leads us to the rather kind of unsettling and, and for some kind of gruesome um, technique of experimental ablation. Experimental ablation refers to intentionally damaging parts of a brain or nervous system and then you watch and see what happens in the aftermath. And the value of this would potentially be is if a certain brain region controls a function, maybe you don't know that yet, but you damage the area and all of a sudden the function goes away, it's like you put two and two together and you go, oh, maybe that brain area was what was responsible for what we were seeing here. So Florenz is among the first to do and use this experimental uh, ablation technique in animals. I think he did it with a lot of cats where he would go in and damage different parts of their nervous system and then later observe to see what they could and couldn't do. So from a scientific clinical perspective, it's incredibly informative to learn about how a nervous system works by doing it that way. Strangely though, Supposedly, uh, Florenz could damage big pieces of cat brains and then not see big changes in their behavior, so that was a little strange. It speaks to some of the redundancy that exists in the brain. But probably more to the point, there's not just a clinical or scientific side to this discussion, there's also kind of a moral and ethical one. And for many people, there is a, a discomfort with this kind of work being done on animals. Uh, I don't want to tell you how to think about that issue. It's a controversial issue to consider. 
a couple of more personal stories that speak to it. Uh, one for myself, I, while I find behavioral neuroscience and biopsychology incredibly fascinating, I, I don't think I could be one of these people who conducts this kind of work with animals. It would seem too cruel. I, I'm too much of an animal lover. Um, I, I don't go so far as to believe it shouldn't be done because I know the incredible value we gain from it, but I don't think I could do it myself. And it's in that kind of ambiguous position that I sit, which probably annoys people on both sides of the issue, but that's where I am. So there's that issue involved. And then I remember a conversation I had with my uh, former colleague, Peter Sparks, who I referred to in class yesterday. And um, he worked in the lab of a prominent neuroscientist who uncovered a lot of the biology of emotion, particularly aggression, a guy by the name of Joseph Ledoux, who we'll meet later in the quarter. Amazing researcher. And um, he was basically trained to become a, a world-class researcher, Peter Sparks was. And he showed up here and wanted to become a teacher. And I remember asking him, why, why the shift? And he kind of flippantly said, I got tired of killing rats. So at some level, that issue kind of got difficult for him to grapple with as well. So again, complex issue, animal research. Um, I don't want to tell you how to think about it. You have to decide that for yourself. But be aware that a surprisingly large percentage of what we know about nervous systems today have come from studying the nervous systems of animals. And Florenz, and as you'll know in a moment here, Broca, were among the first to kind of do that work. Okay, uh, Paul Broca. If you've heard of Broca's area, then know it or not, you, you've encountered Paul Broca before. Um, Broca is one of the individuals who's credited with figuring out some of the parts of the brain that are involved in processing speech. And we'll discuss um, Broca and some of his early ideas when we get to the language section of our course. Um, story is for Broca that he's a, a physician working in a hospital and a patient shows up to be treated for some illness and unfortunately the patient was ill enough that he, he eventually dies I think in the not too distant future after showing up and I don't know if he had permission hopefully he did but Broca decides to do an autopsy and he looks at the brain of this individual and he he notices something unusual and I'll, I'll say what the unusual piece was in a minute but I should probably back up and say before this individual died um, it's not just the case he had an unusual brain he had some unusual behavior um, reportedly for several years in his life, when he went to speak, all he could utter were variations of the word tan, T-A-N. So he would sort of stutter out variations of the word tan whenever he tried to speak to somebody else. Um, if he got upset, he could swear, so you could hear some other words, but if he just tried to talk, it was all tan, 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 tan. And because of this, he became known as Patient Tan. That, that's his name today. So it's Patient Tan who dies after showing up in the hospital. It's Patient Tan's brain who's examined in autopsy. And when Broca looks at his brain, he sees a, a, a large lesion in his left frontal lobes. And he basically does the, the simplistic math of, oh, that area doesn't look like it's working anymore. This individual can't really speak anymore. I wonder if that area that's gone is responsible for speech production. And it turns out that, well, there's a bit of controversy around this. They're more, more or less, that's what it may do. And this area is named after Broca today. It's called Broca's area. So um, in a weird way, Broca is following through on Muller's encouragement too, whether you realize it or not. It's this idea of experimentation. Now, he wasn't going around intentionally damaging the brains of people, but in this case, he found a brain that had been damaged through a stroke, through an incident, through a tumor and then saw what happened in the wake of that. Again, a very common way for us to learn about how brains work. Okay, that's another nice bite-sized piece of this content. So why don't I pause it here and then we'll come back and, and I think finish up here in a moment with the third part. Okay, so stay tuned, thanks.